So I think we'll, we'll begin. Thank you very much for, for coming. Uh, uh, I think we had better stop um, planning events uh, uh, either on Greece or on the Euro crisis because every time we do there's another cataclysm and the stock markets take another dive and there's another protracted um, <coughs> political crisis in, in Athens as, as, as is happening today on all fronts. And one of the casualties um, uh, was Alan Beatty, who had to stay in Washington and couldn't join us, unfortunately. Um, nevertheless, I think that uh, uh, we've got an interesting time ahead of us. We have two wonderful speakers, um, two authors who perform the very rare task of making economic theory readable. Uh, they really both do. Uh, on my left is Justin Fox, um, the editorial director of the Harvard Business Review Group and uh, columnist for Time and uh, other journals, uh, and the author of The Excellent Myth of the Rational Market, which I heartily recommend if you haven't read it. Thank you very much, Justin, for joining us. Uh, and on my right uh, is my friend Yanis Varoufakis uh, from Athens, a professor of economics there. Uh, who taught for a long time in England uh, and then in Australia before uh, going to his present position, Professor of Economics, um, at the University of Athens where he also has uh, set up and run a really wonderful pioneering doctoral program in economics um, and is the author, as you may have guessed, if you passed a pile of books on your way in, of the Global Minotaur, uh, which is an incredibly timely analysis of um, exactly how things have gone wrong both on the policy front and on the theory front since 2008. So I thought we'd start uh, with Yanis talking uh, about his ideas, 15-20 uh, minutes or so. Uh, Justin will uh, respond and then the floor will be open to anybody who would like to ask a question or, or within uh, reasonable time limits make a comment. Um, so Yanis, over to you. Mark, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Justin, for uh, honoring me with, with your presence and with the comments that you will follow. Uh, it's wonderful being at Columbia University in New York, generally, in the United States. A uh, bit of escapism for, from the trials and tribulations of Europe in general and Greece in particular. Since Mark mentioned the title of the book, which is also the title of the talk, um, I thought I would tell you the story of how it, it, it emerged. It was the year 2000. I was still living in Australia. And I had to address a crowd of um, people who, very extremely good intellectuals, but you know in Australia, after, after, by the way, that talk was in a pub. It was called Political Economy in the Pub. That's a typical <laughs> Australian um, concept. And idea. within 15, 20 minutes, one a speaker has to unravel the story because uh, afterwards there is too little blood in people's alcohol. So uh, in an attempt to tell my story quickly and schematically, I came up with the idea of the global minute. The, the, the story I wanted to tell was about what happened to the world, to the global economy after 1971 after the collapse of Bretton Woods, after the collapse of the first post-war phase of global capitalism, uh, which was a phase, it was a golden age, if you want, of capitalism, two, two de decades of steady uh, growth and development that had all sorts of problems, including the Vietnam War, uh, dictatorships, uh, left, right, and center. But nevertheless, it is still being remembered as a paradigm of stability and prosperity. Something happened and that particular um, way of organizing the global social economy went belly up with uh, that pivotal moment on the 15th of August 1971 when President Nixon effectively announced its demise. And that was replaced by another period, again of US hegemony, but quite different from what had preceded it. In researching this book, I came across the most poignant phrase which characterizes this second post-war phase. It belongs to none other than Paul Volcker, that many of you would be familiar with, the ex-chairman of the Fed, 
A month after he was appointed by President Carter, head of the Federal Reserve, he gave a speech somewhere in Europe, I don't remember off the top of my head now exactly where, it doesn't matter, in which he said something quite remarkable for a head of a central bank, and not any central bank, but the Fed. He said that at the juncture that the world finds itself, that was in the late 70s, there is a choice between stability and the controlled disintegration of the world economy. And it is in the interest of the United States of America to opt for the latter. The second phase, indeed, is characterized by a number of contradictions, controlled disintegration, unbalanced equilibrium, incredible growth in income, while at the same time we had an incredible growth in inequality and poverty. So this second phase was what I wanted to depict, to capture by means of a simple story and a simple narrative in that talk that I had to give in the pub. And usually being Greek, I'm extremely um, averse to use Greek metaphors because it's boring you know, after a while. Prometheus and uh, Kavafi and all that, you know, we have a tendency to re repeat our metaphors and, 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 and our allusions. But on that occasion, a Greek metaphor came to mind and I decided to go with it because I, it actually made a lot of sense. It helped me even understand the story that I was trying to tell. So, yeah, and it's the story of the Minotaur. Let me, let me remind you of the parts of the story of the Minotaur, I won't give you the whole story here. It's actually quite long if you, if, if you delve into it, which I did after, I, after beginning to write this book, um, years after I, I first invoked it. Uh, but, but I will concentrate on what matters to us here. The period of the Minoan reign was a period of prosperity, of relative prosperity for the time. Peace which was imposed by the ironclad will of King Minos, according to mythology. But also according to quite a lot of archaeological evidence regarding the spreading and flourishing of trade in the whole of the Eastern Mediterranean during that period. So you find Cretan artifacts in Lebanon, in Egypt, you find Egyptian and Phoenician artifacts in Crete. There is evidence that, that there was prosperity based on trade and peace, actually. Now, the story of the Minotaur concerns a very sad beast, the result of incest, of course, that lives inside the maze-like labyrinth, uh, which is the underground chambers of the palace of King Minos. It is like the nasty underbelly of a great empire. The beast can only be nourished with human flesh. King Minos, who for some reason finds it impossible to imagine his reign continuing without uh, finding a way of sating the appetite, the voracious appetite of the Minotaur that lives in the labyrinth underneath, uses his uh, power in order to extract from the Athenians tributes on a yearly basis or every seven years, depends on which particular version of the myth you read, the tributes take the form of young men and women who are being sent over by the Athenians in ships to Crete to be devoured by the Minotaur. And this, these tributes, this steady flow of tributes, is what maintains peace and prosperity and it is one of the reasons why the kings of Athens, reportedly according to myth, were quite happy to consent to this gruesome ritual. How does this fit in with the second post-war phase? Well, let's start from the first post-war phase. Bretton Woods is uh, a term by which the first post-war phase is known. It was founded on a very simple idea. 
following the end of the, the Second World War, when the United States of America was the only creditor nation, it was the only nation whose economy had actually benefited from the Second World War and whose factories were operating in full, full throttle and capable of producing a great deal more produce than the American economy could itself <coughs> consume, especially after the war ended, and all those uh, tanks and airplanes and bullets and armaments generally would have to be converted into washing machines and cars. Washing machines and cars that would be so plentiful that the American economy could not absorb them. So the new dealers who happened to be in power at the time had a very simple and rational and sensible idea. To maintain the rude health of American manufacturing in the American economy, they had to find a way of recycling these surpluses. The first idea was to dollarize Europe and to some extent Japan. In other words, to take part of the surpluses that were being produced in the United States before a new slump begins in the United States after the end of the war due to a fall in aggregate demand, and to transfer it to Europe and to Japan. In the process, assisting those two countries, Germany and Japan in particular, to rebuild their industries so as to create two new strong currencies that would aid and abet the United States dollar and operate as shock absorbers in case there is a recession in the United States because the new dealers in power were worried about one thing, a repeat of 1929 in a global capitalist environment where the rest of the world was in ashes. So they wanted to create shock absorbers. Now, the whole Bretton Woods era can be seen, therefore, as an extremely complicated and yet simple paradigm of surplus recycling. American surpluses, which were created as a result of the United States trade surplus vis-a-vis -vis Europe and Asia, would then be recycled. About 70% of profits made from sales of American cars, American airplanes, trucks, equipment, and so on and so forth in Asia and Europe would be recycled back to Asia and Europe in the form of either foreign direct investment or direct grants, like the Marshall Plan. Now, the problem with this model was that it was predicated upon the existence of American surpluses. So when Nixon, in August of 1971, declared the end of this phase, that was not an act of willful destruction. It was simply an acknowledgment of the fact that there were no more surpluses to recycle, that America had slipped into a deficit situation. Now, what would the Germans have done if they had entered a deficit situation as opposed to a surplus one? They would have tightened their belts, and they would have tried to do whatever it takes to reduce those deficits. The Americans did the opposite. They thought, OK, we have a deficit. What we're going to do is then we're now going to enhance it and expand it and make it bigger. And of course, then the question is, who pays for it? And the answer is, the rest of the world. We shall continue to recycle surpluses, but this time we're not going to be recycling our own surpluses. When we had them, we recycled them. We're not stingy. Um, we're going to recycle other people's surpluses. And this is precisely what happened under the process of controlled disintegration of the world economy that Paul Volcker described. And I shall be brief in this. The United States was expanding its deficit, its trade deficit. In other words, it was sucking into the United States the net exports of Germany, of Japan, and later of China. And at the same time, the profits that the Japanese, the Germans, and later the Chinese were making, the surpluses, the financialized surpluses, were being sent to New York, <coughs> to Wall Street, voluntarily, not at gunpoint, and why voluntarily? Because German, Japanese, and Chinese investors saw, and it was true, that their capital, financial capital, would find higher rewards in the United States of America, in Wall Street. So it was like tributes of capital sailing across the high oceans, the Atlantic and the Pacific, into Wall Street, just like 
the young men and women in mythological Greece were being utilized in order to, nour to nourish the Minotaur. This time, the global Minotaur was the deficit of the United States of America, which required nourishment in order to continue the recycling of other people's surpluses and to continue to produce demand for other people's products, thus keeping peace and prosperity on the basis of these capital tributes, this tsunami of capital. This is a story that I was telling in 2000, 2001, and then we published, my very good friend and colleague Joseph Halavi and I published an article called The Global Minotaur, based on that story that I had told at the pub. And from then onwards, we started trying to build a tale, a narrative, on that regarding the effects of financialization. When you have a tsunami of capital, crisscrossing, not crisscrossing, crossing, one in a unidirectional way, from Europe and from Asia, across the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans, and lands into Wall Street. And let's just give a figure here. What was that tsunami of capital? It was between three and five billion dollars every working day for 20 years in constant prices. Now, when you give that, all this amount of money to a Wall Street banker, even if it's for 10 seconds a day, 10 minutes a day, and you say, look, take this money and go and invest it in this. What do you think the banker is going to do? I'll tell you what they're going to do. They're going to try, try to find ways of making a nice little earner for themselves on the side. This took the form of financial engineering, of new ways of uh, bundling together other people's capital, other people's debts, and creating synthesized forms of, of, of capital, which would then start trading amongst the bankers, creating a steady flow of revenues for them. It was effectively a process whereby Wall Street, on the back of the tributes that were flowing into the United States to nourish what I call the global minotaur, on the back of that, you had the minting by Wall Street initially, and then by the banks in Europe, of private money. There is the money that the Fed mints and the ECB, and then there was a the private money minted by J.P. Morgan, Lehman Brothers, and the rest in the form of those CDOs and all these pieces of paper that started behaving like money. It was a dream come true. Like we all have dreamt at some point in our lives that there is an ATM in our lounge and keeps churning money out without anybody charging us, this was the equivalent for Wall Street. Now when these pyramids of private money became so large that they could not fit and could not be squeezed into or onto planet Earth, and they collapsed, we had 2008. The tragedy with 2008 was that the collapse of those pyramids mortally wounded what I call the global minute. And what is that? Not just a deficit, but remember the global minute is, it was a recycling mechanism, a way in which the goods produced by the Japanese, by the Germans, and by the Chinese were by being sucked into the United States, generating profits for those companies, which was then being recycled, sent back to Wall Street in the form of the tributes. This recycling was what kept global capitalism in rude health, with all its inequalities and imbalances and incongruities. In 2008, that mechanism, which I call the global minotaur, that beast died. When the original minotaur died, according to mythology, in the hands of Theseus, a hero of the Athenians, a prince, an Athenian prince. That marks, if you want, the end of the, pre, of the mythological era, of the prehistorical era, and the beginning of the archaic era which led to classical history. 
When the global military died, it left our world in a bewildered state. Now, I haven't said the word Europe at all. Let me put it very briefly and then we can have the discussion about Europe. The Eurozone, our common currency, which is now in a state of advanced disintegration, and it is, it is dying as we speak, was created on the presumption that what I call the global minotaur would be there providing it with the stability that it needs. The reason why the Eurozone is dying is because that global minotaur was mortally wounded in 2008. To put it briefly, the idea behind the Eurozone was that the 17 countries that eventually made it up would be able to form a greater Germany. Now, what is the point, that, what is the main characteristic of the German growth model of the post-war era? A very steady, strong, hard currency, the Deutschmark, and net exports. Now, the Germans produce amazing goodies, gleaming cars, wonderful capital goods, astonishing feats of engineering are produced from their factories. But they never had to worry about that which American, French, Italian, and other manufacturers had to worry about. Sources of demand for these things. Because let's not forget that markets do not stimulate demand on the basis of desire or need. They stim stimulate them on the basis of ability to pay. And it was the United States of America, what I call the global minotaur, in the second post-war phase, that generated through its deficits and through this recycling mechanism the requisite demand for Germany's net exports. When we formed the Eurozone in uh, 2000, we tried to pretend that everyone in the Eurozone could behave like Germany, but the, by definition, this is a fallacy. We cannot do that. Because by definition, we can't all be ex net exporters. Because my exports, if they are greater than my imports, then this means the opposite for somebody else. Okay? If I'm a net exporter, you cannot be a net exporter vis-a-vis -vis me. Simple arithmetic. So what kept those shifting tectonic plates from cracking up the Eurozone up until 2008? It was a global minute. It was the fact that the United States of America was creating so much demand for the world's net exporters, including China and Germany, that the Eurozone could be maintained. And the Wall Street banks, aided and abetted by the Eurozone banks, were creating so much private capital money that borrowing costs were extremely low. And that created lots of, of bubbles in Ireland, in the real estate sector, in Greece, the public sector, and so on and so forth. When the Minotaur died under the hubris of the pyramids that the financiers built on its back, the Eurozone's path towards destruction was determined. It does not mean that we cannot salvage the euro. It means that unless we redesign its architecture, it will be history. Thank you. So in the US, over the past couple of years, I, I think it's fair to say that most discussion of why we had a financial crisis and why things suck um, have mostly centered around this debate over whether it's government's fault or Wall Street's fault. And whenever I hear these debates, I, I kind of think, well, couldn't it be both? And that's one of the things I love about Yanis' book. It's not this argument about for or against markets or for or against regulation. It's this is a system that worked for a while that couldn't keep working. And that anyone looking at it could tell it couldn't keep working. And now it stopped working and no one really has a plan for what to do next. Um, but it's striking to me how little this discussion of global capital flows, how small a part of the discussion it is in the US. And I mean, even in the New York Times, in the Wall Street Journal, it's basically, it's Martin Wolf and the FT 
banging on and on about this, and no one else. And, and then you'll hear, you know, economists, some economists talk about it. And one of, one of the things I love about this book is in econom, economists who talk about these usually talk about Bretton Woods and Bretton Woods too. And instead, from Giannis, we've got the global plan and the global minotaur. And I think that's a lot more fun than Bretton Woods too, and more descriptive. Um, I, I think one of the reasons for this, I, it's certainly taken a while for me to get my head around the fact that these things actually, like global monetary arrangements actually matter. But I do think the experience of the 1990s in the US really kind of shut down a lot of these concerns because um, things went well, things got better, and it turns out a lot of that was just this flow of, of capital, and for a time, it was actual being attracted. There were good investments here that didn't exist in other places. But I, I just remember as an economics writer at Fortune in the mid-90s, Fred Berkston from what is now the Peterson Institute of Economics coming by and talking about the trade deficit and the current account deficit, and it just seemed so retro. And, and I, I really think everybody in the U.S. just stopped paying attention to, to, to these dis discussions. I mean, I, I also have this vague memory. I just started coming to me. I was listening to Yanis of talking to Milton Friedman about this once. And he was saying, well, it's probably not a problem because if you look at it, it's just that the U.S. is much more efficient in using capital. So we don't actually, we don't have a real deficit with the world. It's that it's so much better to invest. We're so much more efficient with this capital and can do so much more with it than anybody else. And the, the measure he looked at is that the actual flow of, of interest payments at that point, there was, I think the U.S. was still in net surplus on that. And I don't know, I, I just think of that, I haven't even looked at it lately, so I'm kind of curious. I, I would guess because our interest rates are still low and we're still pulling the money in that that's still true. So what, what's happened is it, it seems clear to me that the biggest issue in the world today should be talking about what Keynes tried to do at Bretton Woods and failed, which was to put together a system that had at least a chance of being sustainable. And that was one where you had this thing called the Bancor, which was the global means of exchange that currencies were, were set against. And again, Giannis can explain this better than I can, but it just had this automatic mechanism when one country got too far in surplus or too far in deficit to start pushing them back toward balance. And you know, the reason that didn't happen, ironically, is because the US, the Harry Dexter White and others with the US could not imagine that there would ever be a time that the US wouldn't be in surplus. So they hated the idea of something that would punish them for being in surplus. They figured the US would always be the country um, with, with the big trade surpluses. Um, so that, and that actually is what Giannis comes around to at the end of the book, and I think it's absolutely right. And there seemed to be a little discussion around the special drawing rights of the IMF a couple years ago, and there was interest, and Michelle Bachman, that, this was actually her first rise to prominence was talking about how Obama was going to take away the dollar. Um, and then that just faded and it had, doesn't seem to have been a priority of the administration and the IMF has had so many other issues going on that it doesn't seem to have pushed that. But I, it, it's, this is what should be the key issue of discussion and within Europe it, it's sort of a similar question of a way to, to force some sort of, of, of balance within Europe. Um, and, and I completely agree with that. And I've, I've got, I want to end with two questions. One is, I'm, as, as an American who's followed American politics pretty closely since the late 70s, early 80s, I'm a little dubious that we were as um, clever and deliberate about creating this global minotaur. I mean, you definitely have some provocative quotes from Volcker, but my sense of that, you know, the Reagan administration, which sort of pushed this thing up to a really, a big new level, that that was, um, that was more pure luck and blundering than any sort of real plan, although it may be that once it started working and they were able to borrow all this money from the rest of the world so cheaply, they were happy to keep that going. And then the, the, the other thing is there's this really key concept at the heart of why, of your book and just why these things like global monetary arrangements and global imbalances matter and that's what you call the surplus recycling mechanism. And I, I would love it if you could try to just give a quick explanation of what that is and why it's so important. And if it's something that just matters between countries or if it has to exist within any economy. 
Great. So, all yours. Three points. The first one concerning uh, the Bretton Woods conference and the American position versus the British, British position. There was uh, Harry Point Dexter on the one hand, on the American corner, and John Mannion Keynes. Two giants, really. I mean, it would have been wonderful. I mean, historians dream to eavesdrop during their conversations, off the record conversation. But I think that the main, I, th I think you put your finger on the nail there. What Keynes was saying was this. And that also refers to the, the question of what is a surplus recycling mechanism. What Keynes was saying was that you need a properly instituted surplus recycling mechanism. The markets would not do it by themselves to recycle surpluses. Now, why is this important? Well, let me remind you, if I go on too, too much, for too long, Mark, shut me up, um, that capitalism began with a kind of intertemporal, through time, surplus recycling. In feudalism, life was simple. You had production, the peasants produced, and they would bring in the harvest. Then you had distribution, okay? So the, the sheriff would come and take the cut that belonged to the Lord, and if the peasants disagreed, they would, their heads would roll, or the sheriff's head would roll if they were too powerful, but some, somehow they resolved that, the, the distribution issue with or without violence. And then finally, you had financialization. The Lord, who couldn't eat all this corn by himself, would sell most of it in rudimentary markets, and therefore he would be financialized. So production, distribution, financialization, that was the, the order. With capitalism, that order is precisely reversed. Once you have an entrepreneur, usually some ex-peasant struggling to survive, renting land from the landlord and having to borrow, often from the landlord, the money to do it and to hire wage laborers. What happens here is before production starts, you have financialization, borrowing, debt, okay? The debt in which the entrepreneur enters in order to organize production. Then you have distribution, because when the entrepreneur says to the workers, I'll give you a pittance, whatever, few pennies here for every day's or week's work, that's distribution. And then in the end, the entrepreneur is a residual claimant, keeps the rest of you know, what is left over after repaying his own debts, having made the sale and having um, uh, collected the revenues. And that's, so it's completely reversed. So capitalism managed to create a great deal of a growth drive because it was effective, the way I, I say it is as if, as if we managed to find a means for taking our arm and pushing it through the time barrier into the future, grabbing future value that has not been produced yet, that's debt, bringing it into the present in order to mobilize the factors of production, you know, machinery, workers, land, to produce that value in the future. So it's recycling. It's recycling between the future and the present. So that's one form of recycling you need. Now, of course, during the industrialization, you had pockets of industrialization, of commodification, of capitalist activity, just like you have in China now, and then the rest of the hinterland, which is still feudal. Now, this means that you will always have, always had, and always will have original imbalances. Some parts have surpluses. Manchester and Birmingham back in England, Shanghai and Shenzhen now. Uh, California and New York State compared to other parts of the United States, and some other parts will not have surpluses, they will have deficits. So California, the Californian economy, the state, will always be in surplus in relation to Arizona, let's say, right? And Arizona will always be in deficit. So how does this work? When you had Italy and Germany, and they, were, they had different currencies, and Italy was always in deficit in relation to Germany, what happened was a, was a, a state, a, a steady re reduction in the value of the Italian lira, which was keeping up, maintaining this balance between the two. When you lock the currencies together, you end up in a situation which is more akin to the relationship between California and Arizona, same currency. 
So how does it work in the United States? There are surplus, surplus recycling mechanisms in the United States. There is the federal budget, which means that if in the state of Nevada, let's say, the rate of unemployment is much higher than elsewhere because it unemployment benefits are financed through the federal budget, there is some recycling there. But primarily in the United States of America, it's the military industrial complex. Because when Boeing goes to, to Pen the Pentagon and says, um, I want a trillion dollars to develop the new fighter plane, the Pentagon says, yes, fine, but I want a factory here and factory there and a factory there. And those places, which I haven't mentioned, are usually deficit states. This is not an act of philanthropy. Well, and military bases tend or to be in deficit bases. states, exactly. too. But so that, what, what, this is exactly what it does. Same in Britain. You know, you have Yorkshire and you have London. Yorkshire will always be in deficit vis-a-vis -vis London. Always, always, always. Especially after the mines were closed, right? So what happens there is that there has to be a surplus recycling mechanism that takes surpluses from London and invests them in roads, something, on, in something in Yorkshire. Otherwise, the surpluses of London will start waning. Now, what applies to a country applies to a, a collection of countries. So when the United States built, in association with the British, Bretton Woods, what they did was they locked the currencies, fixed exchange rates, that's what Bretton Woods was, in order to create stability amongst the capitalist world in the West after 1944. But they knew, because they were smart people and they had been through the Depression, that they needed a surplus recycling mechanism. Where they disagreed, the Americans and the British, Dexter and uh, Keynes, was in the form that that surplus recycling mechanism would take. Keynes' view was that it should be instituted. It should be centralized, it should be written down, there should be clear rules that when surpluses in one country go up, then some hand grabs them and invests them productively, like Boeing does, or is being forced to, in one of the deficit countries of the world that were part of the Bretton Woods system. The Americans said, ah, 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 ah. we don't want to write this down because we are the hegemon, it's our surpluses, and we shall do what we want with them. It's not that they did not want to recycle them. They wanted to have maximum discretionary power in choosing how they would do it. And they did it. You know what, Justin? The American recycling that went on of their own surpluses, of American surpluses, was actually perhaps greater in volume than what Keynes' system would have envisaged during the first 15 years. It's not that they didn't want to recycle American surpluses overseas. They wanted to, to do this in their own way and with their own, at their own discretion. The problem was that at some point they didn't have any surpluses anymore. So I think that answers the first question and the, and the third question. That leaves the second question regarding to what extent was this is intentional. You know, intentionality, just like consent, are very slippery concepts. <laughs> I think that by reading some of the documents which were being bandied about in uh, Washington in 1970, late 1970, and throughout 1971, Kissinger was an important player and his team of people. If you read some of those documents, I ended up becoming a historian in my, in my old age, which I'm not a historian, by the way. Um, but it's extremely exciting to read these documents because suddenly you see that they knew what they were striving for. It is not that because they knew it, it worked. There is no causality together with intentionality here. It just it so happened that I think this was the path of least resistance for global capitalism. The world entered a stagflationary period in the 1970s, and this recycling mechanism, which was assisted by the wild fluctuations in interest rates that Paul Volcker introduced, by the squeezing of median wages in the United States, thus ensuring that while oil prices were shooting up and energy was becoming expensive and was creating inflation throughout the world, American inflation was lower than that of its competitors. So money was flowing into the United States because <coughs> investors hate inflation. So there was inflation in the United States, but it was lower than it was in Germany, lower than it was in, it was in Japan. So the 
plan to disintegrate the economy in order to create this global minotaur was in the head of a number of influential people in the 1970s, and Paul Volcker is one of them. By the time the neoliberals came into power, like Alan Greenspan, I don't believe that they intentionally pursued that line, but their ideology was very well suited to behave as if they were pursuing it. So I think at this point uh, we can open things up for questions. Yes, sir. Well, I'll use the microphone. Please well, I would like to thank you all for your um, very perceptive remarks. Um, you know, my understanding, my take, if you like, of your threesome is you, sp you spoke of political economy and we seem to, forgot, to forget the term, although apparently the Prime Minister's father, Andreas Papandreou, was professor of political economy in Berkeley, not of economics. I may be wrong. And, um, but we don't use the term all that much. Um, it seems to me from what you have said that although the, the, the nature of the of the, the substance of the problem may be economic, the solution would be political. And I further understand from what you have said that uh, in order to be sustainable, a solution, a political solution has to be institutionalized to take the form of, let us say, a new Bretton Woods agreement. Uh, is that possible uh, in the current state of affairs? In other words, the crisis, in fact, which uh, Europe at the moment faces, and uh, uh, perhaps the world at the same time, uh, may be more political than uh, economic in the last analysis. And uh, I'm afraid that the political will to resolve it may not be there, or at least a consensus is not apparent. But I may be wrong. I can, I, can I jump? Because I just want to say one quick thing. Just, I mean, this was the critique of the euro from the beginning, that you've created this economic union, but you've made no real effort to create a real political union and fiscal union. And it's just funny because there were people at the time, I mean, the one I remember is Marty Feldstein's article in Foreign Affairs, which sort of talked about it would lead to war and everybody kind of laughed at it. And I hope that's still a joke. But it's just, it was this obviously unsustainable setup. The, which is my way to give you a softball. Thank you, Justin. <laughs> That's very useful. Firstly, I think you're completely right. Uh, I have to say uh, in my own defense that um, um, even though I, made a, I, I created my career out of pursuing <coughs> mindless economic modeling, because it was the only way of surviving as an academic in economics departments, I am the director of political economy at the University of Athens. So, factual point about Andreas Papandreou, the still current prime minister's father. I don't know whether he's still, he, he may have resigned by the time we, we started this meeting. He's still there? Okay, he's still there. So, Andreas Papandreou was also a mindless economist, like I was. And he was the chairman of the Department of Economics at Berkeley where he actually gutted political economy because he was a strong believer in mathematical economics. Until the conservative government of Konstantin Karamanlis in Greece in 1961 invited him as a good mathematical economist to go to Greece and to set up uh, the center of economic planning. And there he got politically engaged and he realized that Greece was a quasi-neo-fascist state. And he became incredibly politically involved to the extent that he gave up his career as a, as, a, as a mathematical economist and then adopted political economy. So this is just to set the record straight on Andreas Papandreou. Um, will a new global recycling mechanism be instituted the way it was in 1944? I don't know. What I do know is that unless it is, this crisis will continue to mutate and to migrate from one country to another, from one sector to another, from the banking sector to the public sector, sorry, to the, from the private sector, the banking sector to the public sector, from the public sector to manufacturing, from Europe to Asia, from Asia to America, to Latin America, and so on and so forth. That I know. 
1944, the world was, at least the West, was privileged by the fact that there was a single creditor nation emerging out of a massive massacre as the leader of the West, with new dealers in power who had experienced in their bones the awfulness of the Great Depression. At the moment, we don't have that. Hopefully, there will be some kind of, of different agglomeration of political concerns. But my worry is, as a European and as a Greek, that whatever chances there are of bringing together the G20, let's say, in order to create a new rational global plan, those chances, whatever they, they might be, are being jeopardized by Europe. Because Europe is to the world that which Greece is to Europe, the problematic child. And Europe is behaving, behaving like a child, an oversized child, huge child, a giant child, but with a very childish brain. And the problems that, the, that European capitalism is facing are of a higher order than anything that you're facing here in the United States or in Asia because there are structural faults. Let me put it this way. In, you know, the Great Depression condemned huge numbers of people to misery. It did not threaten the existence of the United States of America or the dollar. At the moment, the architecture of the euro is so flimsy that its very existence is in jeopardy. And that's, that's why it's a higher order of, of magnitude of a problem. Uh, Justin, regarding the point you made, I'll answer it by means of a story, which I'd like to tell, because I think it's so insightful. You said that when we created the Eurozone, we had not created the foundations that would allow the edifice to sustain, to, to absorb a nasty shock like that of 2008. This is, of course, what I say too. But it's not true that it happened because those who created the euro didn't know it. And this is where my story goes. In 1991, there was a meeting between three people, two I shall mention. One was President François Mitterrand of France, and the second was the president of the Commission at the time, the European Commission, Jacques Delors. The third person was my friend Stuart Holland, who told me what happened in that meeting. In that meeting, the law, had, had, having been convinced by Stuart about the importance of creating, of adding to the euro system that, they, that was being hatched at the time, uh, a fiscal foundation and also a growth component to have the European Central Bank looking after the monetary stability, you know, being the guardian of the euro, but at the same time having the European Investment Bank capable of issuing its own bonds in association with the ECB as the growth engine of uh, the Eurozone. Jacques Delors, the president of the commission, the smartest person to have become president of the commission, <laughs> was convinced of that and he gave a 40-minute briefing to President Mitterrand on it. And Mitterrand was listening patiently and at the end, Stuart tells me there was a pause when he was actually doing this, and thinking. And after the pause, he turned to Jacques Delors and said to him, Jacques, you are of course right, but we're not going to do this. Because we, Helmut Kohl and I, the Chancellor of Germany at the time and the President of France, we can swing a monetary union. We can't swing what you're suggesting. We just don't have the political cloud to do that. We can bind them together, and he used um, almost a swear word in describing who he's binding together. And when we are no longer in power, in 10 or 15 years afterwards, that was Mitterrand's prediction, when a major crisis happens, our successors will have a, pre a very simple choice between doing what you are suggesting and letting the thing, the thing crumble. So it's not that they didn't know. It was that the political constraints were there, which the, the, the people like Mitterrand and Kohl hoped would have subsided by now, 
and which would have been defeated by the crisis. And therefore, they were hoping that now that the crisis is happening, those institutional uh, foundations are created. It turns out that this is not true, that the political, the political constraints remain there, and our Lilipatian European leaders are not, not up to the task. Walking up to mics, but uh, okay. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Uh, I have questions that will probably be muddled, but you can clarify it for me because you understand this much better than I do. Um, two quick things: uh, among among the protesters here, there are these uh, debate around you know, quote unquote, ending the Fed, returning to the gold standard. Um, I want to know kind of what's behind. I, I don't understand what's behind their motivation. What they're uh, main critique is and what role the Fed has played in the post-1971 uh, situation. And the second is this um, uh, China being asked to basically contribute to this uh, major stabilization fund for Europe. And uh, I, I understand that China is in surplus. Is China now going to, is, is China being asked to play the role that the U.S. Uh, did uh, pre-1971 in terms of uh, having the surplus and circulating around the country and, and what, uh, around the world, and what does that mean? Thank you. you want to have well, a go, Justin? Yeah, I mean, on, on the Fed, I mean, what's fascinating is that the Fed's biggest critics for the last 50 years have always been populist Texans, but it's shifted in this bizarre way from it being, for years it was Henry Gonzalez, who was this Democrat, who wanted the Fed to have easier monetary policy and not worry so much about inflation. And now we've switched around to pretty similar language, although even more extreme, being used by somebody who wants incredibly tight monetary policy, who doesn't want any flexibility in the system. And I, I mean, I, I think it's, it's two things. One is I think a lot of the people who are heeding these and the Fed calls have no idea what they're talking about. And that's fair enough because I think most people in the world, including most economists who talk about monetary policy, don't really know what they're talking about. And then the, the second part is simply that it's this frustration with clearly the Fed has looked out for the financial sector because I think most people, especially in the Federal Reserve banks, like the New York Fed, which does a lot of the day-to-day -day activity in dealing with markets, they, res they answer to the banking community in New York. That's who appoints the board of directors of the New York Fed, who then picks the president. So that's their job, to some extent, is to keep the financial sector healthy. And I think people see it as this rigged game, and the Fed is at the middle of that, and so they're the problem. I mean, I think when my encounters with Greenspan over the, and, and I don't know when this, if, if this was true before the late 80s, but the Fed's line was always, well, we, we we don't care, we're not involved in currency policy or global capital flows stuff. That's, that's the Treasury's job. We don't have anything to do with it. And obviously that's nonsense because the level of interest rates that the Fed sets has a big effect on that, but that's been this convenient fiction for the Fed to sort of stay out of this discussion. And I mean, I think one, Edwin Truman, who was the Fed's guy in the late 90s, running around the world actually with Tim Geithner and trying to um, blow out all these financial fires all over the place. I, I, I feel like he's somebody who got that and now he's one of the more interesting, common, he, he's another one of the few voices in the US who is talking about these same issues all the time. But uh, I mean, I, I think at some level with this, this end the Fed movement, and actually this is something I, I see a lot in the US discussion right now, it's almost like this longing to return to the natural state. It's all these, we've all become followers of Rousseau without even knowing it. It's this idea that somehow, if there weren't a Fed, if there weren't such big government, then markets would just work and bad banks and bad companies would fail and everything would be fine. And you know, at some level, there's, there's some amount of truth to that. Obviously, you get a really skewed system when you bail out big failures. But at the same time, I, I think the message of Giannis's book, the message of anybody who studies the history of economics, or of, of economies, is that it's unstable. Capitalism is unstable. That doesn't mean it's bad. It doesn't mean it's the wrong system. I think it's a system that creates a lot of wealth, but it's not stable. It doesn't lead to perfect equilibrium if only left alone. 
And I think that's another thing that's behind this and the Fed idea. If, if only we didn't have these horrible central bankers there. Well, the Fed was created because we had big financial crises and they were supposed to make that not happen anymore. And at some level, I guess in the US, they're less frequent, but man, when they happen, they're big. You made two points or asked two questions. One was this one, the other one, was, the other, the other one concerned the Chinese and the FSF, but I'll, I'll, I'll answer both. Uh, look, people have excellent reasons for being cross with the bankers and to, to be cross with those who were supposed to be keeping the bankers in check, like the Fed and the authorities, the regulators. The problem is when our protesting tends to adopt a simplistic answer. Because let's not forget, what did 1929 teach us? That the hatred of the bankers can be <coughs> shared between, on the one hand, extremely decent people who criticize the banks for all the right reasons, and the Nazis who built a whole campaign against liberal democracy on the hatred of the, Nazi, of the bank, the banker and the Jew. So we have to beware that Firstly, hatred is not a good guide. Criticism is what we need. And criticism requires depth and not epidermic, simple interpretations. So the banks have acted criminally. I've already made this point about bringing down uh, the world economy through financialization. The banks need to be broken up the banks have to be reined in. The idea there is such a thing as financial innovation has to be jettisoned because there is no such thing as financial innovation. Paul Volcker, my hero, <laughs> said that the only financial innovation he has uh, experienced in his lifetime is the ATM. <laughs> okay? But to then go primitive and say that the solution is to get rid of money and go back to metals, metal fetishism, is absurd. You can only go back to, me to, to, to metals if effectively you erase 150 years of uh, economic development. And you cannot go, and you should not want to go in, in, in that direction. Let me remind you that what 1929 did was to destroy the gold standard. The gold standard is perfectly consistent with bubbles. 1920s was a huge bubble built upon the back of the gold standard. So these simplistic views are much more <coughs> akin to the mentality of the Tea Party than to the protesters of Occupy Wall Street. Now regarding China, China is not, never going to lend to the bailout fund of the Europeans. They are too smart to do that. But the interesting question is, why are the Europeans asking money from the poor Chinese? And the Chinese are poor compared to the Europeans, even though they are a surplus region. Now, let me remind you that about a month ago, Tim Geithner, the US Treasury Sec uh, Secretary, came to Europe to give some advice to our European finance ministers. Usually, I'm not one to wax lyrical about Tim Geithner, but on that occasion, what Tim Geithner had to say to the Europeans was very sensible. I won't get into it, it doesn't matter. What, it was, what is interesting was the reaction to that piece of advice. They threw him out of the meeting. <laughs> they were indignant. They said, how dare the Americans lecture us on the debt crisis when their debt crisis is worse than ours? which simply made me panic because it meant that they have no concept of, what, of, the, of the true nature of the problem in, in Europe. Because the problem in Europe is not the size of the debt, it's the structural problems that Europe has. It's the foundations. It's like, I keep saying this, but it's the only way I can convey it. It's like looking at a big building and saying, oh my God, it's so big, it's so heavy, it will fall. No, it won't fall. If the foundations are sound, it won't fall. You can have a much, much lighter building that falls if its foundations are shoddy. Right? And then a month later, 
the Europeans, having castigated Tim Geithner, say, well, now we're in trouble, we can't fund our bailouts, so we will ask the Chinese for help. My goodness. Right? Now, the Chinese would have no problem investing in Europe, even lending to Europe, if they saw a rational plan. But there's no rational plan. And this EFSF bailout fund has only one in intention. It always did from the moment it was devised at the time when, the, when Greece received its first bailout, till now. And what was this objective? To buy time for Germany so that Germany can decide whether it wants to get out of the Euro or to bind itself to the master of the Euro forever. It's a decision that Germany has not made yet. And the reason why I'm saying that is because we, Europe is rich enough to find the money in itself in order to fund the black holes that we have in Europe, whether these are banks or states. But they are insisting on what I call the principle of perfectly separable debts, that every euro of debt in, in Europe will belong to one country and one country alone. There will be no shared debt. So they've devised a system for bailing some countries out by using money from other countries, such that the countries that borrow money in order, or guarantee loans to the ones that have fallen do so in a way that each one of them keeps their part of the loan separate from the others. This is like creating a Lehman Brothers-like toxic derivative. Why are they doing it? Because they want to keep their exit option. Surplus countries in Europe have not decided yet to do what it takes to solve the crisis because doing what it takes to solve the crisis, and it's very simple to do it, you don't need the help of the Chinese for that, it means that then they will not be able to get out of the euro. Why? Because there will be some common degree of indebtedness, some common debt. So in order to buy more time, they go to the Chinese and say, will you do it for us? And the Chinese rightly will say and have said, not on your nelly. Um, Professor Varfakis, uh, thank you so much. Uh, on behalf of the uh, European Students Association and uh, the National Hellenic Student Association, we really appreciate that you are among us uh, today here in Colombia, and uh, uh, we've been chasing you a lot lately, and uh, we are going to uh, take the advantage of this opportunity of your presence here and uh, try also to get a small video uh, uh, like uh, yeah, video for our conference in uh, Harvard in three days. Uh, so this is going to be a series of videos uh, about exactly what we are talking here. And uh, this will include, hopefully, uh, Bob Mandel, uh, who spoke about optimum currency areas, who spoke about fixing uh, and the disequilibriums in uh, fiscal unions, and uh, who spoke about the US and Europe and uh, compared uh, the two cases. Uh, Jeffrey Sachs, who spoke about transfer of payment system and recycling surpluses and how to absorb this kind of uh, uh, disequilibriums, as we said. So we, I think that this is exactly what you are also talking about, and uh, we would like to have this homogeneity of topics uh, uh, so we can educate ourselves in f first place and our communities around the universities in the U.S. and back in Greece. So I would like to, to, to get your point about uh, political leadership and uh, political leadership on, at the international level, at the European level, and the Greek level. So the, Europe, uh, the international level, uh, 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 here uh, we, we spoke about on the, uh, on the top of the first question about uh, this uh, Breton bread on woods and after the collapse of the current situation after 2008 uh, is there a question anywhere in our future? what was that is there a question anywhere in our future <laughs> exactly no sh here we go i, I guess so Let's hmm? thank you uh so uh my question is do you do you do you see any political leadership uh any political leader coming uh instead of uh, someone else like George Soros that did a Bretton Woods, uh, tried to make a Bretton Woods too, uh, 
to, to establish a second uh, recycling mechanism um, for, for, for on the international level. On the European level, do you, see, do you think that uh, the latest, uh, the latest uh, decision on October 26th approaches in any case, uh, at any point, the fiscal union that we are struggling to get uh, in Europe uh, with the leverage of EFSF, the recapitalization of the banks, and of course the program from Greece. And the third uh, question is about Greece. And given that you are smart enough not to run for elections, what do you think it's going to be uh, the political future in Greece and how we can get something sustainable? I mean, we are still debating whether we will have a, a president, uh, a new government, three days now. And uh, I, I'm very curious to learn about your position on the international level, European level, and the Greek level as well. Thank you. And sorry for the time. Okay. Thank you for the, for the question. Um, the questions. I'll start backwards. Once a railway has begun the process of derailment, it really doesn't matter who is driving it. <laughs> That's my answer regarding Greece. Regarding the 26th of October Brussels Agreement, it will go down in history unless there is a sharp change in direction at the European level, not at the Greek level. It will go down in history together with the 21st of July summit agreement that preceded it as the final nails in the coffin of the euro. Not only do I see nothing in there, in that agreement, that inspires hope, but what I do see in that agreement is an attempt to fix three problems that has produced three major new weapons of mass destruction within the European Union. I won't elaborate further. I'll simply give you a very brief answer. The only good thing I can tell you about this agreement is that it already is irrelevant in the sense that all the things that it set out to do, it has done in the sense that it has effectively thrown uh, Italy off the cliff. So if everything else in that agreement is gone, is just gone. Regarding political leadership, the news is not good. The United States of America is ungovernable. You don't have a government. You have a White House, an administration, and a Congress which are locked into mortal combat, and only idiocy comes out of that. Just inane exchanges. Now, if you do get a government, I'll be very glad to see that happen. But when you do, we'll talk about the game. In the European Union, we have a council of our European leaders um, comprising some very smart people who never speak their mind. Because the moment Mrs. Merkel walks in, they shut up. And you know what? They have reasons to do so. I was talking to uh, the finance minister of one of the major countries, I won't say who, in the European Union. And we were having a, 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 a conversation, a very affable conversation, on the proposal that Stuart Holland and I have been banding around now for a year and a half, two years. And when I realized that he was in agreement with this, it was actually a conversation over Skype, um, about the wonders of modern technology. Both Stuart and I said to him, but if you are agreeing with us, why are you trying to support us in promoting this, this, this proposal in Brussels here and there? Why don't you do it? You're in ECOFIN. You are the minister of a major country. The minister of finance, not the minister of education, of finance. And the answer was, if I do it, it will immediately result in the skyrocketing of the interest rates that my country has to pay to borrow money because the markets will consider what I'm saying. They will not read the proposal that I'm discussing. They will simply see it as a weakness of my country vis-a-vis -vis Germany. And if I open my mouth, then 
the German minister, Mr. Schäuble, is going to shut me up. And the great fear of these political leaders is that Germany will leave the euro. And therefore, they don't speak their minds. Similarly with bankers, who may agree with some of the things that we say, but they are too fearful of markets and what will happen to their share value if they are seen to agree with a discussion along those lines, because that agreement will be interpreted as a weakness of their own particular bank. So we are caught in this conundrum of either um, a kind of impasse like the one you have here between Congress and the administration, or a situation where there is a conspiracy of silence by intelligent people who are not conspirators, it's just that they are very fearful of what will happen if they open their mouth. And that is a democratic deficit. If our elected leaders have good cause to fear opening their mouths, and they don't open their mouths while the Titanic is shifting very closely, edging towards the, the iceberg, then we have a combination of a fiscal deficit, an investment deficit, and a democratic deficit. So I'm afraid that this is my answer. Um, I'd like to ask you both uh, a couple of, couple of questions, interlocking questions. You've both written uh, really revealingly, I think, about uh, economic theory as a problem, uh, what you call toxic economics. And one of the things that strikes me in all of this is how, despite <coughs> such writing, there seems to be very little shift, either intellectually uh, at the moment, very little questioning of uh, economics or the role of economists, or of, of some of the more uh, um, lethal policy instruments that you talk about, CDOs and, and so forth. So I'm, I, I, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts about um, what it would take to uh, get a reassessment of, of theory and policy. And the other uh, sort of facet of this comes back to the first question. It's the, it's the question of institutions. And um, I, the, the thing that strikes, that strikes me is, is that Bretton Woods was, um, uh, came in the heyday of, of, of terrific confidence uh, in the power of institutions uh, and in the power of of politicians and policy makers and civil servants to craft institutions that would make a difference and, and operate over a very long term. And they, they, they had the, the depression, the New Deal uh, in their minds and they had the experience of fighting the war in their minds and, and planning for the peace more or less from the time that the war broke out in institutional terms. Uh, well, uh, we seem to live in uh, uh, a world this is where the policymakers have abandoned all of that, and where the, which has given up confidence institutions. You were talking about the Fed and attitudes to the Fed, um, and 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 so the policymakers find it difficult to uh, identify a role for themselves, other than that of second guessing the markets. Um, so I wonder uh, what the institutional plausible institutional fixes are in your mind. Um, that would help here. Your, your, your primary uh, uh, image is that of the surplus recycling mechanism, uh, which, which can come in a variety of institutional packages. Uh, Martin Wolf had a column in the FT today, you may have, you may have seen it, and it, from a very different perspective, um, has been talking in very similar terms to you about the importance of, of recycling mechanisms. <laughs> Uh, and, and like you, and this is where I wanted to push you, it seemed that actually you wouldn't really need much in the way of institutional readjustment. All you need is for Angela Merkel and the German elite to come to their senses and to start acting as the global minotaur. Uh, is, that, is that right? Is that what you think? Just to start first. Um, now I've got to remember back to the very beginning. Yeah, I, I mean, what's the, the thing that happened in economics, I think, is that mathematical treatments turned out to
to be extremely useful in dealing with microeconomic problems at the firm level, at the individual level. And, and to a certain extent, this sort of image of the economy as a self-correcting thing. There are lots of amazing ways at the level of individual markets or firms, and even broader, where things that don't work get pushed aside and things that work go forward. You know, products that work succeed, products that don't work don't. And, and I think that what happened at the time of the creation of Bretton Woods, there was this very clear, you know, that, that, that mathematical microeconomics was on the rise, but everybody who did it knew that it didn't quite work when you applied it to the overall economy. And so you had this increasingly sophisticated and mathematical sort of economics dealing with micro issues, and macro remained this kludgy Keynesian thing about, um, basically flows of this going there and the other way, and it wasn't based on any sort of foundation of rational man or anything like that. It was just a, an attempt to model how the world actually worked. And so, I mean, one of the fascinating things that I learned about reading the book is I, clearly there was ideological freight to it, but I think for a lot of these people, it was just these young grad students um, learning all these cool new ways that they could um, manipulate theories and numbers and, and wondering, well, why am I only allowed to do that for these questions and not for these questions? And why do we have this beautiful construct of rational decision making and we only bring it this far, we don't bring it to explain the whole world? And that's very Robert Lucas, who's the guy behind, you know, probably the most major force behind where macroeconomics went. Um, starting in the 1970s. That's totally how he explained it. It's just, I was just trying to take the theories of Paul Samuelson and apply them, you know, make them apply to everything. And the problem is, I, th I think just what's so clear from the experience is the truths you learn at the micro level don't apply at the macro level in economics. And that, and I, and I don't think economists have really dealt with that at all because I, I think people in macro are very defensive right now. I mean, the Tom Sargent and Chris Sims winning the Nobel this year, and, and I, I don't know Sims very well, but Sargent is very much completely of this world where the whole idea is let's start with people with rational expectations and try to build a model of the whole economy. And Sargent would admit that these models don't explain much, but he still thinks it's the only game in town. And, and I, I, you know, Robert Skidelsky, the biographer, of, wrote this great three-volume three biography of Keynes. He had a book that came out a couple years ago, and his big argument was in, in the future, no one should be allowed to get a degree in macroeconomics unless they take history classes and sociology classes and psychology classes and lots of other things, which I'm sure would be good for your business. Um, but I, I can't imagine that's happened here at Columbia. <laughs> One thing that is happening is there are a lot of young grad students studying financial crises, which at least is something, which wasn't happening before because there wasn't one. Well, actually, there were lots to study, but they weren't here in the U.S., so. Imagine if the Nobel Prize for Medicine was given to someone whose work began on the assumption that cancer is impossible. This is what is happening in economics. Sargent and others behind, before him built whole glimmering careers on mathematical models whose primary hidden axiom, but nevertheless there, otherwise the model doesn't work, you cannot solve it mathematically, is that there can never be a crisis, that a crisis is impossible. Well, and this reminds me, there's this wonderful moment early in the creation of modern academic finance, which is very much along the same lines as what Sargent has done, where um, Franco Manigliani and Merton Miller were trying to some, solve this problem in finance. And they just said, you know, we know there have been bubbles and crashes and such, but for the purposes of this particular problem, let's assume them away. We're just, it's just to solve this problem, let's assume them away. And what you saw is within 10 years, they were assumed away for the purposes of answering exactly. all problems. Look, the way to understand the economics profession, firstly, it's not science, it's a religion with equations. <laughs> Let's get, get this straight. And I say this as somebody who created, made a career out of being, as I said before, a mathematical economist. So I think I, I have some credence in saying this. Now, from the 1870s, prior to the 1870s, there were no economists. Adam Smith 
was a moral philosopher. Karl Marx was a revolutionary. David Ricardo was a landowner who also bought himself uh, a seat in the House of Commons in order to lambast his own political class. Um, John Stuart Mill was what John Stuart Mill, Stuart, Stuart Mill was. Professionalization of economics came together with mathematization for a very, very simple reason. The way to, to, to convince presidents of universities, chancellors, and so on, that the chair in economics was important and should be instituted was to say, we are to society what physicists are to nature, scientists. Now, because they were not particularly inventive people, inv inventive people they simply followed, copied the rule book of physics, of 19th century physics, which is what? You start with a grand axiom, you build a mathematical model, you work out theorems from it, and then, in physics, you go to the lab to find out if it's right or not. In economics, there is no lab, so if enough people believe it, it's true. Okay? That current of economics was always part of the ecology of the economics profession. There were always these economists hanging around. Now, the thing with economic models, with mathematical economic models, is that they are notoriously difficult to solve. We have in mathematical economics what's called the problem of indeterminacy. It's like having a, a, a system of two equations with four unknowns. You have to make assumptions in order to solve it, right? There are too many unknowns. So you need certain assumptions. Some of them have to be hidden because they look very iffy in order to close the model. Now. There were always these people who were playing with these models, and some of these models are extremely <coughs> aesthetically pleasing. I mean, I've, had, I've spent months and months working on these models, knowing full well that they are completely irrelevant, but nevertheless, like chess, chess is irrelevant, it's still a nice game, and it's also very good for the mind. So if, if you don't believe your own rhetoric from your mathematical models, they can be fun and very useful, you know, as intellectual exercises. The problem started with the collapse of Bretton Woods. Because at that point, the perfect storm was created. Two historical forces met. On the one hand, you had the financialization drive, which required mathematical models that were utilized in order to prefigure the value of these derivatives. Now, these models had to be solved, and axioms had to be made. And the only way of solving them and say, this CDO is worth $1,000, was by introducing the standard assumption that there would be no crisis. Because if you allow for a crisis to happen inside your modeling, the mathematics is indeterminate. And then you can't solve it, and you can't pinpoint a value for the derivative. So suddenly, the, econom the economists who were always making a career out of those beautiful, aesthetically pleasing models, suddenly became a hot commodity in the world of finance. And as political goods were devalued and financial goods were revalued, those economists in the good universities like yours here, who were producing these equilibrium models, as we call them, models that are, are solvable and result in equilibria, suddenly got all the research grants. They got to choose who gets appointed. They had all the nice, cozy links with the financial sector. And because the financial sector was also determining who is running the Fed and who was running the regulatory authorities to a very large extent, there was a lot of coziness in the relationship between acad academic economists, the banks, and government. And those who said, hang on, guys, this axiom of yours is idiotic, they simply didn't get tenure. Well, because I, I got, this is just reminding me so much of this story, wonderful story from the mid-'80s when Bob Schiller, who maybe I think he already had tenure before he started mm -hmm. doing this work, he wrote this famous paper in about 81 just pointing out that the stock market price movements were a lot more volatile 
than any underlying data he could find about the companies on the market. So he's simply saying, well, gee, markets seem to be a lot more volatile than the underlying economy, and therefore markets aren't efficient or rational or whatever else. And Robert Merton, um, who went on to win the Nobel that most embar immediately embarrassed the Nobel Committee because a few months later, long-term capital management, where he's a partner, collapsed. Um, he... He Collapse requiring a multi-billion dollar infusion from yeah. the U.S. taxpayer, right? Not just collapsed. We, we, we're here to help. Um, <laughs> Merton's response was this wonderful, he said, you know, if, if, if Schiller's right, you know, this entire edifice we built collapses. It doesn't work. You know, our whole uh, option pricing theory, derivatives, efficient market, none of it works if, if Schiller's right. So, why don't we turn the question around? And you know, financial market prices are the most transparent, easily measured things in the world. Maybe the problem is with all the other measures. Maybe financial market prices are all right, and the problem is these corporate earnings are misreported, and tax data are all wrong. Justin, this so is going back to mythology. <laughs> <laughs> this is precisely what was happening with the Delphic Oracle. When the Delphic Oracle made predictions that didn't come, did not come about, what did the powers that be do? They went back to the Delphic Oracle for another ex interpretation of why the previous um, prediction was false. So the problem with mythology is that there can be no event, no observation that will overthrow it. <coughs> because myths are reproduced simply because the web of beliefs is such that those who believe in it will always try to explain the failure of their system of beliefs to explain by appealing to the same system of beliefs. So the whole thing is reproduced. In the context of academia, take, I'll tell you my experience. My experience when I was doing my PhD in the very early 1980s, in 1982, it was abundantly clear to me that if I wanted to get my PhD approved, and then a position, a lectureship. Then I would have to close some mathematical model. So I would have to make all these assumptions myself. And my supervisor, who was also a mathematical e economist who didn't believe in these things, said to me, just close the bloody things, <coughs> get tenure, and then you can speak your mind. But I submitted to you that for a very large number of people going through grad school in economics, spending 15, 20 years working on these models, closing them on the basis of these axioms, there is what psychologists say, cognitive dissonance. You do one thing in your professional life from which you actually earn all your, um, your colors and uh, your accolades and your positions, and then you believe another thing. Now that creates dissonance in, psychologically in your head. At some point, if you say X and at the same thing, time you do not believe in X, one of the thing, the two is going to give. And what gives is the belief. If you keep saying X, 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 then suddenly you start jettisoning the disbelief in X. And this, I've, I've watched it with fellow colleagues of mine. It happens. Some residue of the truth remains in their head and it is a time of crisis that they come and say, my goodness, you know, we all went wrong. But <coughs> after Wall Street has been bailed out again, and it is resurgent, and the summer's Geithner plan brings them back into the business of derivative creation, then this cozy relationship between academia and, and Wall Street starts again, and the counter-revolution in economics begins, and you have again a reinforcement but, Mark, you also asked a question about institutions in, in Europe and the world. You're absolutely right. It's not a question of changing the mindset of Mrs. Merkel. You need institutions you know, which will do that. Uh, we don't have much time, so I'm not going to over-labor the point. But when it comes to what needs to be done, let's say, in the European Union, uh, those of us who have been working on, on very specific proposals on how to save the euro from... In, from from, from the Europeans, what we've tried to do is to focus exactly on what you're saying. What institutions do we have in place, and how can they be reinforced in order to make possible 
this new change of policy, because it's not a matter of willpower. It has to be. So in, in, in particular, we focus a lot on what needs, to do, we, what needs to be done to change the culture of the ECB and what needs to be done in terms of practical, simple measures that upgrade the institutional importance and functioning of the European Investment Bank in order to bring a new deal to Europe. And I think we need to have a similar conversation about the United States and the rest of the world. Lady there, yes, thank you. Um, we'll have one more question after you. So one please. quick one. In, uh, in defense of the impossible, I'd like to ask this question. If big, huge companies give credit, I can understand where, if we were still dealing with metals a long time ago, gold would disappear, money, paper money would disappear, eventually, you know, uh, the, the, the thing that you are, uh, are, are handling back and forth would no longer exist. But if in, big com in today's government of cyber, where the money actually does not, there's no cash, nobody gives each other a check, nobody gives each other anything, um, you know, a, a solid thing. And if this money is traveling in cyberspace only for a few minutes from one company to another company, the second company sells further and on and on and on, then where is this lost money that has been lost? And my question is, is there really a financial crisis or are we just being told that there is a financial crisis? Where is this money that is lost? It, to me, it seems like the expansion of the universe. Where does the expansion begin? I mean, where does it go? <laughs> oh, you look at me with... Oh, I'll, yeah, I'll answer. No, 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 I'm, I'm quite happy to answer question. this. Now, I mean, it, well, oh. one, one, there's one part of the answer is distributional. Um, I mean, you look at, okay, we had this period of growth, be it imaginary or not, and then this period of crisis, and you look at, you know, who had money left over after it. And that matters. I mean, it somehow became out of fashion to talk about it in this country. But it, it's just when you look at, I, I don't know whose fault the financial crisis is. I just know that there's one, a couple of sectors of people who ended up with a lot of money afterwards, and the vast majority of the population were worse off than they were 15 years ago or 10 years ago. And, and so in that sense, in a distributional sense, the money changed hands to some extent, and that matters. 49 million Americans live on $15 a day. That's a real crisis. It's not a balance sheet crisis. When uh, in Greece you go into the electricity company to pay your bill, you'll find there are people who are not queuing up to have their bill paid, there are people who are queuing up to have their electricity supply discontinued because they can't afford electricity and they are choosing to use whatever um, some paltry sum of euros they have left to buy foodstuffs from the supermarket cheaply than to pay for their electricity bill. Now this is a real crisis. When it comes to the notion of what's happening to the money when it's digitized, I think we should simply get over this. We did get over this thousands of years ago. The idea that there is such a thing as real money as opposed to fictitious money is false. That there is public money and private money, yes, that is a distinction which I've already, already made and I believe that it's significant. But all money is by definition a matter of belief. Let me remind you of the Greek word for money for coins, nomisma, as Aristotle said. It comes from the, the verb to believe. The only reason why currency, why a coin, why a note, why a credit card um, has value is because there is a common belief that it does. It's self-referential. It's the only way it can be. And you know what? It's fine that it should be that way. So metal fetishism has to be abandoned. In the final analysis, why is gold valuable? I think that's probably a good note on, on which to end. We can continue the conversation uh, informally afterwards, but uh, please join me in thanking Justin Fox and Yanis for wonderful. Thank you.